Three Days Grace is a band that surprised me a lot in that it really seems like they shouldn't be as big as they are. Like if you asked me back in 2007 or something, if they would even be around in 2024, I would have laughed at you, let alone that they would be one of the biggest names in alternative rock. But that is exactly what they are with over 12 million Spotify listeners, six albums in the Billboard Top 10, three of which went platinum and still selling out arenas to this day, thanks to songs like this. And what's especially interesting to me now is that they've been sort of retconned as being part of the 2000s emo movement, even though at the time, at least as far as I can tell, they had absolutely nothing to do with it other than, I guess, maybe their haircuts. But still, the fact is that they're one of the quintessential gateway bands for an entire generation of rock and metal fans. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that the three days grace to knock loose pipeline is real. And the question is, how did they do it? How did a seemingly unassuming group of friends from Ontario, Canada become such such an iconic band, and how did they get retconned as emo? Those are the questions that I will answer in this video. And also, I'd like to thank DraftKings for sponsoring this video. Whether you're cheering on your alma mater, or you just love the thrill of college football, you are going to want to listen to this, because I've partnered up with DraftKings, and they have an offer that's perfect for game day. Right now, all new customers who bet just $5 will instantly get $200 in bonus bets. And that is something we can all celebrate, right? So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now at the link in the description and sign up using my promo code PUNKROCK. The crown is yours. That's $200 in bonus bets instantly after betting just $5. Stay in on the action and use your $250 in bonus bets to bet anytime touchdowns on DraftKings. DraftKings is the place to bet on touchdowns. And if sports betting is not yet available in your area, don't worry. You can still join in on all the fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy and have a shot to win cash prizes. So if you want to check it out, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use my promo code PUNKROCK and bet just $5 on any wager and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code PUNKROCK only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Our story begins way back in 1992 with a quintet known as Groundswell hailing from Norwood, Ontario. Their debut album called Wave of Popular Feeling was released way back in 1995 when most of the members were still in high school. And you can kind of sort of hear the foundation of what they would go on to become. Although, as I'm guessing the guys in the band would tell you, it's pretty rough around the edges. It's definitely a lot more grunge than it is like rock or emo, but if you're a fan of the band, it's definitely worth checking out. But the story really gets started in 1997. Three of the members of the band reunited, this time under the name Three Days Grace, and in 2003, they released their debut album also called Three Days Grace. And even though it was their debut album, the core of the band really had 11 years of experience playing together, so they came to the table a lot more polished, and it quickly catapulted them into pretty much mainstream stardom. The lead single, I Hate Everything About You, got tons and tons of airplay. If you were around back then, you'll remember how much this song basically got spammed on rock radio. The album itself went on to go double platinum in the United States, as well as platinum in Canada, and to this day is regarded by a lot of people as really one of the foundational gateway albums of the early 2000s. And musically, they were at the forefront of what I guess we would now call the butt rock movement. And by the way, for anybody who is wondering where that term came from, as I understand it, it's from all the rock radio stations that had the station ID that went like, welcome to KISW, where we play nothing but rock. And I think what differentiated Three Days Grace from a lot of their peers is that they were a lot grungier than bands like, say, Breaking Benjamin or Skillet. But in their case, I think it was less about sounding grunge, but more so about kind of just having that general grunge vibe while still being very much a modern active rock band. It, 
But despite the monumental success that they were having on the back of their debut album, things were not going all that well in the Three Days Grace camp. And around this time, their vocalist, Adam Gontier, struggled with an addiction to the prescription opiate called OxyContin. And back then, I think not that many people were aware of how serious that could be. But in the 20 years or so since then, you've probably heard a lot about how many people this drug has killed. And it's no joke. My stepsister actually died when we were 20 of an overdose on a similar drug. And so knowing that he was dealing with some very, very serious shit, in 2005, Adam got help from the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, which fortunately seemed to be a success for him. I, I mean, the, the only advice that I could give to anybody that is in that situation or you know, are going through the same type of thing is that you need to talk about it and get it out there if, uh, and you can never, you'll, you'll never change unless you want to. Um, so you can't really change for anybody else. You have to change for yourself. And I think kind of fueled by everything that he had gone through, he channeled all of that into their most successful album to date called One X, which came out in June of 2006. <laughs> And once again, if you're around back then, you will know exactly how massive this thing was. It seemed like they were just totally inescapable, like almost every single song from this album was played on rock radio constantly. And I think it really speaks a lot to the album's quality that you could just pick pretty much any track off the album and it was worthy of being a single. Like it's really just about as good as it gets for active rock or as we would call it now, butt rock. One of the biggest highlights of the album is the song Never Too Late, which a lot of people cite as being one of those songs that saved their life. And at the time, the topic of mental health and music was definitely there, but I think not the way it is now. And this song in particular, I think was one of the first times in heavy music where the message wasn't like, I'm in this terrible dark place and I'm never gonna get out of it, things are hopeless, and really took a more positive spin on it of like, yes, I'm in a bad place and things are tough, but I still know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. And with the average Three Days Grace listener at the time being these sort of moody, angsty teenagers or young people, people who I think were used to listening to music that basically just poured fuel on the fire in terms of their depression. I think to hear that was a big wake up call for a lot of rock fans at the time. And overall, the album was a smash success. It went on to become certified triple platinum in America and in Canada. And to this day, I think there's a lot of people who would say that this was one of the formative albums that got them into this genre. Following that, they released a live album in 2008 as a way to stay active, but not necessarily have to commit to making a whole studio album and started laying the groundwork for what would become their third album, which eventually did come out in 2009 called Life Starts Now. And this was a bit of a departure compared to the first two albums. The main thing being that it was a lot more upbeat, much less of the dark, sad sound of their first two albums, with more of a sort of upbeat mood to the whole thing. I don't think it was any sort of like massive night and day difference, but to me it was enough to be a nice change of pace. And once again, commercially, it was a massive success. It debuted at number three on Billboard, and it was nominated for Album of the Year at the Juno Awards, which is kind of like the Canadian Grammys. And that would continue to be the trend for their next album, Transit of Venus, which came out in October of 2012. You left me here like it and this continued their string of basically unbeaten back-to-back -back successes, debuting at number five on Billboard in America and number four in Canada. And musically, it was kind of like if they combined everything they had done up to that point, while also sprinkling in some kind of industrial elements and with more of an emphasis on that sort of big budget studio production. Almost like if they took what they had been doing before, but also took a page out of the Nine Inch Nails playbook. There's times it did. Some fans, I think, were kind of turned off by that direction at the time, but overall, I think it was pretty well received. But as a lot of you know, this would end up being the last album for this era of the band, as Adam decided to leave the band over creative differences. This was shocking to both fans and the guys in the band themselves, considering that Adam's vocals were sort of like the focal point of the entire band, and it was sort of up in the air as to whether Three Days Grace would even continue or not. There's creative differences. Um... I wasn't in, I was starting to just uh, not enjoy playing music as much, you know, and, and at that point, that's when I realized I had to take a good look and, yeah, at myself and, you know, 
change what I was doing. But ultimately they made the, I think, difficult choice to continue with a new vocalist, something that generally speaking tends to sort of kill a band. In this case, going with Matt from My Darkest Days, who also happened to be the younger brother of Three Days Grace's bassist. Initially, fans didn't really seem to like Matt as the vocalist, mostly just because he sounded very different from Adam. And that's just one of those things where it's incredibly difficult to replace a vocalist for that exact reason because their voice, their face, their ideas, their lyrics, people associate that with the entire band. So replacing the vocalist almost feels like a different band and it's pretty rare for fans to ever be accepting of that. But still the band kept going, even in the face of all this doubt from the fans and released their next album called Human in March of 2015. And as you can hear, he's still a very different vocalist from Adam, just like a completely different overall timber, a lot less raspy, really just a completely different beast. But at the same time, the album was just kind of undeniably great with a lot of people, even the ones who weren't necessarily wild about the new vocalist, agreeing that it was one of the best albums they'd put out, which to me is pretty surprising and really admirable for a band this late into their career and with a new vocalist. I think part of that is because musically it had a little bit more of an edge compared to their last two albums. It definitely had more in common with an album like 1X than it did, say, with Transit of Venus. But at the same time, they also accomplished the very difficult creative challenge of mixing things up just enough to where it didn't feel like they were just treading water and redoing what they had done before, but with a different vocalist, which is a genuinely tough balance to strike. Because on the one hand, you have a new singer, and so you want to change things up to match them and their strengths. But at the same time, you also want to keep the fans happy, and you don't necessarily want to change the band's entire identity overnight. Like I said, it's a genuinely really difficult creative challenge, and I think they struck a very good balance on this album. And with the band's future kind of hinging on this album, I would imagine that everybody in their camp was probably on pins and needles, wondering sort of, could they make it work with this new vocalist? And the answer was yes. Yes, they could, because commercially it was once again a huge success for the band. It debuted at number two in Canada and number 16 on Billboard and went on to become certified gold in Canada, which is really impressive considering that number one, they had a new vocalist and number two, this was an album in the streaming era. So to compare it to the sales of their previous albums that came out before that really just sort of doesn't make sense. All in all, it was an incredibly strong comeback for the band, despite losing what most people would consider to be the core component of the band. And this is a trend that would continue on their next album, Outsider, which came out in March of 2018. And this one was a little bit of a different story in my opinion. Yes, it did well commercially, just like they always do, but I would say this one really was not anywhere near as good as their previous albums. It's certainly not bad by any means, but it just doesn't seem to really hit as much as Human did. Maybe it's because they had relieved the pressure of having something to prove. Maybe there was something else going on behind the scenes. I don't know. Just in general, I feel like it has less standout moments. That sort of unique atmosphere of Human isn't quite there. In general, in my opinion, just kind of a step down from their previous albums. With that being said, it's certainly not bad by any means. It has some very strong songs such as the lead single, The Mountain, or the opening track, Right Left Wrong. So But even if this album wasn't necessarily their strongest, on the one hand, every band has ups and downs. There really isn't any band where like every single album they do over the course of 20 years is better than the last one. That's just sort of not how art works. With their next album called Explosions in 2022, they proved that they still had it. This one, I think it's fair to say, is a massive step up compared to Outsider. For one, it had a lot of really strong standout songs that were sort of missing from Outsider, but it was also just very different from anything else they had done up to this point. Most notably, it was probably the heaviest thing they had done in their career, which is pretty rare for a band this deep into it. And I'm not saying that it was like death metal or anything like that. They've never been about being super heavy as a band. It's just not really their selling point, nor should it be. But it was still a nice change of pace to hear. Again, especially considering the band was so deep into their career. And all of that while also having some of the catchiest, hardest hitting songs in their catalog, which is pretty incredible considering that the very first iteration of this band formed 30 years before. The thought, 
grace and which brings us to the last question of this video what is three days grace's lasting impact for one, like I said earlier, they were one of the gateway bands for literally millions and millions and millions of kids to get into this kind of music. That's right, the most diehard black metal elitist you know that has the Reverorm Eb Malacht poster on his wall. I don't know if they even make posters, but that guy probably had a Three Days Grace shirt in high school. Another thing is that Three Days Grace is surprisingly popular with young people these days, with a lot of their music showing up in TikToks and memes, I think as sort of part of the overall Y2K thing. I can't talk right now. I'm making piss. So if you can see but the last thing to point out, I think, is the positive impact they've had on really like a whole generation of teenagers who are into alternative music. This is a part of the band that I think a lot of people maybe don't appreciate. Like if you go to the comments for the music video for Never Too Late, pretty much every other comment is about how this song saved them from taking their own life. If you look at their other songs, you'll see a lot of other comments. And I think it's really just pretty clear that this band had a really serious positive impact on a lot of people who listen to them. And ultimately, what's more important than that? So with with all of that being said, I have no idea when they'll decide to hang it up because they still do incredibly well for themselves and they've been going strong for over 30 years now. But whenever they do, I think they're going to be looked back on as one of the bands that defined an entire generation of alternative music. All right, my friends, that does it for this video. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. Also, I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the True Cult level or above. Patrons get all my videos early. I do giveaways and Q&As sometimes, and there's a way to have me review your music. So if any of that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm gonna sign off for now, but I will see you next time.